Welcome to the latest edition of At the Table. We've got a lot to talk about this morning. New mayor, new convention coming to the city, and oh my gosh, Kim Fox's surprise announcement that she's not gonna run again. Joining me now is a terrific political panel. From the Sun-Times, we have Fran Spielman, the City Hall reporter. From our partner, WBEZ, we have two reporters who are also Sun-Times columnists, Natalie Moore, and Auden Lowry. Then we have three Democratic political operatives who keep themselves busy in local, state, and other campaigns. Becky Carroll, C Strategies. Aviva Bowen, The Strategy Group. Tom Bowen, New Chicago Consulting. They all had clients in the elections or causes, but they're here today to give us their most shrewd political analysis. Let me start with Fran Spielman. Fran, Kim Fox isn't running. Her announcement comes just weeks before Brandon Johnson will be sworn in May 15th as the new mayor. Fran, what is the impact of her announcement? Well, I don't think this was a surprise at all. The only question was whether she was going to resign and cut short her term or just call it quits after two terms. I think she's tired. She's tired of being uh, the pin cushion for so much uh, criticism and blame for, of course, Jesse Smollett. But, you know, she's never been able to live that down and she feels it's been overblown beyond belief. But also she feels it's been unfair that she's been blamed for the violent crime. Now, she has been criticized for going easy on criminals, for... Uh, raising the threshold for shoplifting and charging that with a felony to a thousand dollars, but she's not responsible for the outbreak of violent crime. However, police officers and the police union have made her the uh, the fall guy for all of that. And Lori Lightfoot hasn't helped either because she took off after uh, Kim Fox repeatedly, and so did David Brown. So I think she's tired. I think she's had it. And who knows what she's going to go on to, but she's she's finished doing this. So, Alden, in April 8th column, our headline was, no one has all the answers to Chicago's crime problems. So Kim Fox, who was part of the restorative justice uh, group of prosecutors who were elected in some big cities in the United States, uh, have put on the table a different way of looking at crime and prosecutions. So her announced departure comes as Johnson is coming in with crime a number one issue. So who's going to have the answers, Alden? Well, I, I, I don't think any of us have a definitive answer. I mean, that was the, the, the kind of the point I was trying to get across there. Uh, I do think that Kim Fox, Brandon Johnson, and uh, a number of others have put forth what they think are more effective approaches. And I think there's something to be said about some of the things that they've talked about. They highlight the inequities. They highlight uh, uh, the fact that uh, an over-aggressive uh, strategy, both in terms of crime fighting and also in terms of prosecution, may cause more harm than good and may sweep people into that um, that uh, should raise questions for us in terms of the validity and the effectiveness of that strategy. But even coming from that restorative justice side, there's still a lot of questions about the things that they've put forward, if those themselves are really going to get us to where we want to go. Um, it's a conversation, and it's a conversation that I think uh, has been going on and should continue. The thing I think about Kim Fox's departure that I find really notable is, and Fran speaks to this, uh, the fact that she was tired. She was beat up incessantly uh, during her time in office. And it leads me to wonder if we can still have an actual conversation where we talk about and debate what are the best approaches if we're, if the people who are putting forth an alternative approach than what we've always followed are going to be attacked uh, and berated the way Kim Fox was, can we have an open dialogue if you think differently than what we've done um, and, and not actually be able to have people engage with you uh, on an even level uh, in that conversation? So my hope is that we're not going to get to that point, but her departure to me seems to be a signal that if Brandon Johnson continues on the course that he has, um, that uh, he's going to kind of be next in the line of fire and will face the same kind of pushback that Kim Fox did. So... 
who wants to answer this one? Should Brandon Johnson and the CTU that backed him, the newest political machine in Chicago, are they, should they, will they, do you think, get behind a candidate for state's attorney, do it early, and try to elect someone? And you all know Brandon Johnson a lot better than I do. Is he the type of mayor-elect who, as mayor, will want to have a say in figuring out and trying to elect the next Cook County state's attorney? Okay, if I don't hear from anyone, Tom, I, uh, Well, okay, I good. think he'll leave that to County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, uh -huh. his patron also. She's good the point. one who controls the budget of the of the yeah. state's attorney's office. She's the one who handpicked her chief of staff and Kim Fox to be this state's attorney and the activist state's attorney that she has been. And so I think she's probably maneuvering, and I think she is maneuvering already to try to slide someone in there or to back somebody. And of course, she doubles as the Democratic Party chairman. I don't think Brandon Johnson is going to do that. I think he has so many other challenges. So I also think, I'll, I'll chime in if that's all right. Um, I also think historically, we have seen mayors use the state's attorney as a bit of a foil, right? When things are bad. Right. You point to the prosecutor as being responsible. Um, that's not to say I think that mayor like Johnson and, and and labor and others won't get involved. It's probably a little early the morning after the announcement um, to know when or if that'll happen. I will say, and I would encourage everyone, not because I, I worked for the state's attorney at one point, to, um, to go back and watch her speech yesterday at City Club because before she uh, indicated her plans to uh, to finish out her term and then not run again. She gave a really remarkable speech. She brought people into the room who had been wrongfully convicted, who she helped um, clear. She talked about her work on restorative uh, justice. She talked about the crime numbers. And yeah, she went right after some of her detractors at times by name. But, you know, like her or not, and then you look at, brief look at Twitter this morning, you're, you'll see both. Um, in, in full force, um, I don't think it's deniable that she is. She has made a remarkable impact, and she gave a tremendous city club speech yesterday. Hmm. I want to turn now to Marilette Brandon uh, Johnson. So Tom Bowen, he has so much on his plate right now. What does he have to do? For, what is what is the priority? Do you think? in terms of his politics and his policy. What does he have to do? And I do know that picking a police superintendent is, is probably a, a big job, but what does he do yeah. and how does he keep his, his uh, various factions uh, happy that he united to end up being mayor? Well, the most important thing he has to do is create the structures for government that will reflect um, his policy and the new administration's uh, top priorities, uh, and then start integrating with all the other levels of government in uh, Cook County and Illinois. You know, Chicago doesn't give uh, its new mayors a lot of help in a transition process. Um, you know, they're they're run by basically nonprofits that the uh, winners have to form. There's a very, very short amount of time to do that. Um, and voters have an expectation of uh, their leaders um, working hard on their behalf every day. And I, I want to connect this a bit to the next race for uh, state's attorney. You know, one of the problems of the modern era of media and politics, um, and it's why someone like Donald Trump was able to be successful, is there is a performance aspect of this. Um, and the policies are important. The governing is important. But if you're not uh, performing in such a way to deliver a message through free media to the voters about what you're doing, um, it falls on deaf ears. So he has to govern, he has to get that going, but he also has to have a strong communication plan uh, and you know deliver that performance so voters know what he's doing. So Natalie- I was gonna add oh, to that. Becky? I was just gonna add to that that, you know, uh, mayor elects these days, and I think for anyone who's new to office, the honeymoon period is much shorter, I think. Some time ago, maybe folks were given like a year to kind of settle in, uh, you know, figure things out. And that's just not the case anymore. And Mayor Lef Johnson is going to be coming in right on the heels of the summer when crime is going to spike. And for any mayor, that's going to be always a tremendous challenge. So having that leadership team in place um, is going to be really critical. 
Uh, it's beyond, you know, knowing where the bathrooms are, right? It's, it's really having people in place who are going to be able that you can delegate to so he can focus to Tom's point about the kind of performance part of it. He's going to have to continuously communicate to voters uh, what he's trying to do to ensure that he's going to keep the city safe with, you know, very high expectations, I think, heading into office about what his approach is, is going to be. So, Natalie, you wrote a column that had a headline, after a tight r race, the black political establishment may face uh, a, a reckoning here. So, Brandon Johnson is coming into a city council with, uh, what, 14 new aldermen, uh, maybe they're going to feel more empowered. Maybe not. What's what's the what's the um, what's the approach that you see developing in, in your analysis for the incoming mayor? There appeared to be a disconnect. Well, there was a disconnect between what voters, largely on the south and west sides and the black wards, wanted, which was Brandon Johnson, versus some of the alders who decided to go for a ballast. Um, I think that there was a combination of, of reasons. Uh, I think people want to go with who they perceive as the winner. And some of those alders might have thought, well, I can bring, um, you know, a tre treasure trove back to my community. Um, I also think that Paul Ballas knows how to uh, glad handle mm -hmm. and probably made a lot of promises to people um, for in exchange for their support. Um, I don't know that a bunch of alders are going to get kicked out of office because it's four years from now that, that they would be um, reelected. But I think that they should take notice that whatever their reasons were for going for ballots, um, their constituents did not. And so how do they, I, I don't necessarily, Brandon Johnson has not um, come off as someone who is vindictive. So I don't necessarily think that he's going to withhold resources from the eighth ward, the ninth ward, for example. But what are those relationships going to be like with those alders um, as he keeps his promises um, and is how the the elected, the city council members decide how they want to play ball? And it's so, Fran, you have seen many new mayors and many new city councils. Will the aldermen, alders, excuse me, well, the alders, as you, Natalie, I think that's the, I like that it's a nice gender neutral way to say it. So and I'm going to use this. And it's shorter. <laughs> well, the alders, which could be the name of a new Chicago sports team, if we have mm. a new sport. I play for, I play center for the alders. Uh, but anyway, Franny, you have seen mayors come and go and city councils that try to be strong councils and weaken a mayor. Uh, what's your analysis of who's going to show up wielding the gavel? Is it a strong mayor, a conciliatory well, mayor? Well, or the what? mayor is, mayor, mayor Johnson has to make a decision quickly about whether he's going to mess with the city council reorganization that the alderman decided to put through before he even got in. Uh, four years of tension with Lori Lightfoot and her dictatorial style and her, you know, her high-handedness and arrogance, they believe. Um, remember some of the the episodes where she said, don't ask me for a blank if you don't vote for my budget, she told the Black Caucus. Um, things like that uh, caused them to reorganize themselves. A lot of it was self-preservation. It was led by three of the aldermen who were uh, backers of Lori Lightfoot who went on the wrong, who chose the wrong horse in the mayor's race. So the mayor of Chicago is going to have to decide, does he mess with this reorganization that has 29 committees, I mean, 28 committees, nine more than before that we didn't even need in the first place. The 19 was, were too many. A lot of them didn't meet. Is he going to mess with that? Is he going to put his own stamp on it? Is he? Does he want some of his own loyalists and some of these so, very key positions? Or is he going to leave it alone and move on to the do, bigger does he have fights to, that he needs? Does he have to decide this right away? Yeah, because the uh, the first meeting after the inaugural, the inaugural is technically a city council meeting. No real business is yeah. conducted there. They swear them in. 
Then they have a meeting a couple of days later where the, the reorganization is approved and ratified. So because the old council approved the reorganization, the new council has to do it. And so that would be the opportunity for the mayor to exert his will if he wants to, or does he decide, you know what, this is an important, uh, I think I'll wait and fight another battle uh, hmm. that are more important than this. So another thing he has to do, okay, so he has to figure out what he wants to do with his city council. So Becky, what is the route to developing a relationship with the business community, which some of the big hitters were for Paul Vallis? Where does he go? How does he do it? Who's the go-between? How's it going to work out? Sure. Well, I think the business community is smart enough to know that, you know, in order for a city to be successful, they need a mayor to be successful. And I think they've already demonstrated that they want to build relationships with him. They want to support him. And I think he's done the same. I mean, who that person is or who those people are, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not certain that we, we know all those details yet, but... There's already been a tremendous amount of engagement between business leaders, civic leaders, and his transition team and himself. And I feel confident that even if they weren't Team Johnson, they're going to be Team Mayor Johnson, and they're going to step up to do what it takes because, you know, we need to move the city forward. And I think, if anything, um, Mayor Elect Johnson has demonstrated that he wants to be collaborative. And they're not always going to see eye to eye, but I'm hopeful that they'll find somewhere in the middle to meet when they may not always see seem eye to eye, uh, because we need to do whatever we can to ensure that you know the 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 economy of the city is moving forward. Uh, just recently, the Chicago Feds came out and said that we might be um, on the verge of a recession here, a much a much steeper one. So I think they need to lock arms and work together and make sure they're looking out for the city. So I want to ask a question that I hope everyone weighs in on in a pithy and insightful way. He ran, Brandon Johnson ran to the left of the left. Uh, we're talking about a democratic city we have variations within the left of center. Usually, you know, there's kind of a saying, you run from the left, you govern from the center. Does anyone think that is going to happen? And then if so, how can it happen with keeping the base vote, the people who brought Brandon Johnson to the dance, happy? So, Aviva, what do you think? You know, I think Alden said earlier he was hopeful about the ability to, you know, talk about public safety. I don't want to quote him exactly because I'll, yeah. I'll do it incorrectly, but from both a, you know, a root causes standpoint and a, you know, a, a more traditional policing standpoint. I think we saw Brandon do that in the campaign. People didn't want a defund or, um, or progressive choice. It wasn't binary. It was more nuanced. And I think he's going to, I'm hopeful, as Alden was, earlier that he's going to be able to thread that needle. I think you people underestimate him at their own peril. I think he wants um, he wants Chicago to be successful. And I think, as Becky said, like the business community is, does too. Um, I don't think it's about being team Brandon or team business. I think it's about being team Chicago and everyone ought to want that. Um, so I'm hopeful that he's going to be able to both um, stay true to his values, but govern effectively. I mean, look at, you know, I think a lot of people were surprised he chose a chief of staff, not from the far progressive left, not that looked like his transition committee, frankly, but someone with a, you know, uh, several decades of respected service in City Hall, um, who, who knows how to manage special events and large scale um, uh, issues that we're going to need you know, maybe a, a navigator as we as we start to build the DNC here. I think that took some people by surprise, but it was, in my opinion, a, a smart choice and a shrewd one. So, Alden, what do you think? Can the new mayor, will the new mayor, do you think, reading the tea leaves, move to the center, and how will he keep the base happy in doing so? I mean, that's a, a very delicate balance. Um, from the little that I've seen uh, uh, from Brandon Johnson during the course of the campaign, I would say I believe he has the the skills and the charisma to potentially pull it off. Um, as Viva mentioned, um, you know, Brandon 
shifted some during the campaign, uh, particularly early in the campaign when it appeared clear to him that he had a real chance at this thing. Um, I, when we first heard from him, uh, some of those very strong principles around defund the police were things that he did not back away from, but we saw him shift. I think we're going to continue to see him shift. Uh, as Becky was talking about this business relationship that that he's trying to build and that the business community is trying to build with him, you know, he has talked during a campaign about wanting to bring back the the uh, employee head tax, and that is kind of like you know blasphemy <laughs> among the business community in Chicago. Um, so will he stay true to that promise, or will he kind of back away from that? Because I'm sure the business community is not at all uh, interested in in going back to those days. Uh, so that's one thing that I'm really interested in seeing how he navigates, and that'll be a good sign of how well he might be able to do this. He's also talked about a couple of things that if we remember back to Lori Lightfoot when she was running, she didn't necessarily solidify a promise to bring about the financial transactions tax or uh, the graduated real estate tax that people wanted. But those were things that the uh, kind of um, grassroots community had been asking for for many, many years. Um, and she at least entertained, at least committee gave the impression that she would be open to those things. And once she got in office, we saw her very clearly uh, step away from from those positions. So I expect to see uh, Mayor Johnson do some similar moves. The question is, how well can he kind of maintain the relationship with the people who got him into office and letting them know, hey, my overall strategy is this. There's going to have to be some give and take here. And then how well will he be able to communicate with the folks on the business side with the folks who are in the parts of Chicago who are really demanding a very aggressive approach with regard to crime, you know, how will he be able to kind of manage that balance with them and perhaps get them to see that, you know, hey, we're trying to get to the same goal. There are some things that I think we should do differently. And here's how that's going to come. And his choice for superintendent will probably be the first real sign of how he will you know, kind of navigate that balance, because that choice is going to communicate a great deal to people about where he stands on public safety and, and how he'll We should govern. also say that, w that he's going to choose an interim first, and that is, that's his problem, because to get through the summer, he's going to have to choose an interim superintendent because Eric Carter is leaving on inauguration day. So he's got to find someone temporarily and then make a great choice permanently. Right, because I don't when, know when if is, I would frame it. I don't know if I, I don't look at it as is he going to govern from the center? I think it's more about what compromises is he going to make? Mm -hmm. And I've seen activists transition into elected office and they don't always do so well because they have a much broader um, constituency that they have to serve. But I think that he's savvy enough to know what he can and, and cannot do. So it's not just the the police. Like, what is he? Is he going to keep Pedro Martinez um, as head of CPS? What is he going to do with the housing de uh, department, planning and development? So there are a lot of other ways that he can signal. Mm -hmm. Is he going to? I I think that he will keep true to the progressive nature on issues about root causes. Um, mental health, or at least trying on those things. Um, housing. I think that the other areas get tricky with business and public safety because it's such a varied way of um, of how people feel. Because even though he won, um, not everybody. Won. I mean, it, it was close enough where there are people who still only have the the framework of law and order and they will never change on how they feel about more police or the idea of more police that's better police because that's all this society knows. It's hard to um, be lofty when you haven't seen an experience that um, that he and others may talk about. And I, I finally would say, look at Kim Fox. Um, her base, you know, they, they looked at her being in office as harm reduction that let's have someone who we can talk to, even if we're not getting our our way. And they worked with her, even if they were taking her to task. So I think that uh, Mayor Johnson will get some of that too. So I want, and actually just remind me, in a moment after we hear from Tom on this question and moving to the center, I want to, Alden, you did the best number crunching of the results and I have some questions for you. Uh, so, but Tom, what about my my thought about moving to the center and keeping the base uh, solidified? 
I think folks should look at the fact that Brandon Johnson didn't run a traditional playbook uh, political career for mayor, comes out of the progressive left um, and use that to uh, his um, advantage in this race and was elected um, because of that. And I, I caution folks to think about politics, not just so locally, but also nationally. Um, and the ability of political leaders were very in tune with political bases um, and being able to sort of convince them uh, that his success is their success as well. So I, I wouldn't necessarily think of this as go to the left, into the center, uh, the traditional way. I, I, I think he's going to cut his own cloth here, and I think he understands modern political uh, times pretty well. So I would look for this to be um, perhaps him dragging the center towards him. So, Alden, in your, you did an exquisite with your colleague, Amy, uh, number crunching <clears throat> over on your WBEZ uh, analysis. I found that it was of the many kind of remarkable things that you did in your crunching, I encourage everyone just to, to read this for yourself, but the, the point here was that Johnson was able to win with the Lightfoot precincts coming over. So does that mean that this was something that is a permanent base of support? Is it ephemeral? And uh, you had so many uh, analysis of who showed up to vote, who didn't. Could you just tell us what you think out of all the things you had there, what maybe would be the two most important insights for us to know about and take away? as we look at the new mayor and how we won and maybe the, as they say at the National Archives, is the past going to be prologue? Um, I, I would say the two things that were, the two things that I think that were really kind of poignant that stuck with me uh, of, of all the things that we kind of highlighted. Um, one was that, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, literally, <laughs> Uh, I want to say somewhere around maybe 80 percent of the additional votes uh, between the February election and the April election uh, that were that were cast in those precincts that went to Lightfoot. And this is a considerable amount of precincts. I mean, almost 400 precincts across the city, almost primarily solely on the south and west sides of the city, majority black uh, precincts. Um, that had gone favorite Lightfoot. She didn't win a majority of many of those precincts, but she was the top vote getter in in, in these precincts. Um, practically eighty percent of those additional votes went to Brandon Johnson in the in the uh, April election, and uh, so I, I think there was certainly an aspect of Johnson that contributed to that because Johnson did fare relatively well in those precincts, but he was typically behind both uh, Lightfoot and Willie Wilson uh, in those precincts, but he was still showed up, you know, uh, among the top three in the vast majority of those precincts. So he still had some 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 affinity there with, with folks. Um, but I think it was also a statement about what they did not like, what that they heard from Paul Vallis. And, uh, and so, so I think there's a there's there's both of those things playing. It's a nod to Johnson, but also a, a clear uh, sign that they they were opposed to 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 Vallis and and what much what Vallis was uh, communicating during the campaign. The other takeaway that I think is was really interesting about this. I had a conversation with a, a former colleague of mine who was a an activist. Um, uh, we both worked at the Community Renewal Society when I was at the Chicago Reporter many years ago. And he told me that that the kind of progressive community, like the key to winning elections in Chicago, is getting kind of like the uh, communities of color, uh, black and Latino communities in particular, and kind of the progressive white vote. And 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 by that he says, you know, I'm not saying the late front liberals. He's saying I'm talking about the the really progressive white voters that are in Chicago. And he says, if you get those three groups together, you've got a combination that can win practically any election in Chicago. And to some degree, that's what Brandon Johnson got. He got votes uh, in the far north side, uh, those racially mixed communities uh, in Rogers Park, Edgewater, uh, Uptown. He didn't get the, you know, part of what had been considered the lakefront liberal crew uh, in like Lincoln Park and Lakeview. Um, but then he also got a, a swell of voters uh, kind of along Milwaukee Avenue, if you if you will, uh, precincts that include a lot of kind of younger yeah. uh, white progressive voters. Isn't uh, there a name for, for that? Is it Hipster Corridor or something like that? 
What do they call I that? I think that's a that's a term. Yeah, that's been yeah. thrown around. So so vote. he I, I, he yeah. got he got um, he split the vote in Latino precincts, but but he dominated in black precincts, and then he got a sizable number of votes in those areas that I talked about on the north side and along the, the north lakefront. So those were the two things that I think really kind of kind of came away for me as the strongest points uh, that we saw in that April election. And those white voters are, I'm sorry, uh, Fran, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Those white voters uh, in those uh, progressive precincts, um, I think really turned out, you know, we, it's gonna be some time before we can see age data on the file. Um, but those white progressive voters turned out in uh, huge numbers compared to previous runoffs. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, in the black wards, um, those numbers were down compared to previous runoffs. Um, I'm really interested to see if there's some pandemic effects in the black community. So I want to take a look at what's going on in past elections, you know, sort of ratios between black voters and white voters turning out. Um, but uh, uh, the volume of increase for those most progressive white wards um, was very substantial. One, one, one point I would say with regard to those black precincts, so, so the numbers were relatively modest in terms of turnout. However, what we had seen in previous elections was that um, when precincts went for the candidate, and this was both evident in 2015 and in 2019, precincts that uh, went for a candidate that did not make the runoff, generally speaking, turnout, with the exception of the precincts that went for Willie Wilson in, in both elections, interestingly. But uh, but generally speaking, though the turnout in those those precincts would actually be, would underperform in the April election. This time around, however, those precincts that went for Lightfoot in the February election, their turnout was actually a bit higher than it was in a runoff. And these are largely those Black voters. So if that pattern in 2015 and 2019 generally holds, we would have expected to see a little lower turnout in those precincts in this April election, but we actually saw uh, a couple of percentage points higher. So to, to that to that degree, those black voters who might have skipped because uh, Lightfoot didn't make it, they turned out and they turned out for Johnson. Again, the numbers were lower there turnout wise than they were in some of those uh, those progressive white precincts. But but that slight increase to me was an indication that there was at least some level of interest in this time not sitting out and coming out to vote. Yeah, and I think, you know, the numbers might not tell us this once we've had a chance to kind of break them down, but I think there were also two kind of a powerful combination going on in the runoff with what was a very polarized choice for a lot of people. You had Mayor like Johnson, who had like, you know, a, a progressive vision um, and enthusiasm, like the base was enthusiastic to fight and vote. For him. They were excited about him. They connected with his vision. And you cu couple that with some real skepticism about Paul Vallis' bona fides and his, in his own words, right? And and I think the Johnson campaign did a good job of shining a light. Um, and you don't have to do a whole lot. There's not a lot of finger on the scale here or thumb on the scale when you just say his own words, hey, he's not supportive of abortion and he considers himself more of a Republican than a Democrat. In Chicago, that's not going to play. And so what's really interesting is that Johnson was able to run away from his own words about defund. There were plenty of his own words on that. But Vallis left such a trail of breadcrumbs on Facebook and Twitter mm -hmm. and on, in his drive to be relevant when he was out of power. He was right. so desperate for attention that he left a trail that was longer than imaginable for someone who planned to run for office again. It is astounding how yeah. he shot himself in the foot. He was But a look how far he got this time. Right. But he made the runoff with those statements. He right. didn't, what was he, ninth place before? So adopting this posture, whether you know he believes these things or he was just trying to be relevant. He, he hadn't made it this far. So I think that we can't forget that either. Mm -hmm. Well, but in a one-on-one, on one, it's a totally that, different dynamic. Becky? You know? No, because so you have to couple all that with the fact that, you know, these are modern electoral times and you have to have a ground game and you have to focus on early vote and vote by mail. And Ballas did not have a vote by mail program. And he's running against a candidate who, you know, probably rock the ground game better than anyone in the history of mayoral politics. And then, you know, you have an election that's in the middle of spring break, who's off on spring break, teachers are off. And then I think a lot of folks who were ballast voters, they're on vacation with their kids. And to like be frankly that 
derelict in not having a vote by mail program. I mean, he deserved to lose on that alone from an operative, you know, perspective. That's Especially when you yeah. consider the edit, that he had more money than God. He yeah. had 18, no, no. $19 million. What right. did he do with it? It's inexcusable that he didn't have a mail campaign. Yeah. I mean, look, he's zeroed in on a real fear. I'm not discounting people's real fear about public safety here. He's zeroed in on that. He went for a very singular message um, and, and really just, like as Fran said, kept hammering, you know, the mayor-elect's uh, previous statements about defund. But, you know, to where we started this conversation, I think voters demonstrated they want a more nuanced approach to public safety. They know it's going to take smarter policing, community policing, better policing, and they want to invest in mental health in communities that have been historically left behind and job creation. And I think that Brandon was able to talk about those things in a very compelling um, and believable way. And, you know, in the end, a, a combination of things just, you know, Vallis fell short. He was he was playing to fear, which is powerful. But again, Brandon had enthusiasm and vision. And in the end, that won out. So technically, yeah, I, I think what that, they're... Yeah. I was going to say, I always wonder what the Vallis polling looked like, because I know folks like Aviva and I and Tom saw polling, to Aviva's point, you know, yeah, voters are looking for something nuanced. They just don't want tough on crime. Like most people, they want to make sure people who are doing criminal acts are being addressed, but they want to make sure that we're addressing the root causes of crime. And I never really heard Vallis speak to that. And I think Brandon Johnson eloquently spoke to that uh, and spoke that he met voters where they were in that respect. We're almost going to add that. I want to. Oh, I was just going to okay. say quickly Go that on. I think that in 2019, running away from defund the police would have been more um, damaging. But defund the police, even though it isn't accepted mainstream, it is part of mainstream discourse. And I, that has to be taken into account, which is why I think that he was able to distance themselves from that. Um, but again, four years earlier, I don't think that that would be the case. 2020 changed sure. the conversation locally and nationally about right. defunding the police. New topic. I do have to also say okay. that Brandon Johnson is a extremely talented communicator. Paul Vallis comes off like a professor talking down <laughs> to people. Brandon Johnson makes a connection with human beings he does it very effectively. He also has a collaborative personality, unlike Lori Lightfoot, which could make him far more successful as a leader of Chicago, rallying people to his cause. And on that, here's- Yeah, Fran, you hit it on the head there. I think people are looking for something very different in the wake of Lightfoot. I mean, whether folks were with her or not, there was just a lack of that kind of empathy and connection with like, everyday people and voters in the city and Brandon certainly tapped into that. So I want to change topics. Democratic convention. Becky, I want to stick with you for a minute. You have been involved and probably Tom and Aviva too have been involved in various aspects of conventions. Uh, what, Becky, hold the thought. Has everybody been to at least one convention? My first convention was in 1992. Um, Fran, I know what you were in Philadelphia, Asheville. Where were we? We New, were. You, I was. At the, my first convention was New York in 1980 when Jimmy Carter, I think, was okay. renominated. Was it? So yeah. that's Jimmy Carter. Natalie, have you been to a convention? And what was your first one? I have. I have not. Well, you're going to get to one soon. Alden, have you been to a convention? I have not. So we have convention La Lapalooza, Lola, because a Lola convention uh, in 2024 will have Milwaukee in July of 2024 up the road, and then we have the Democrats coming to Chicago. Becky, you have worked in various uh, roles in conventions. What's the next thing that's going to happen? We had the announcement now a few weeks ago. Sure. Well, they have to put together the team. There's going to be, you know, host committee here in Chicago. There will be a CEO. Uh, they have to put together the committee uh, co-chairs. They need to name a finance chair. I mean, in order for 
all of this excitement to happen, they need to raise a lot of money. And I do think there will be folks who will open up their their wallet a lot for this, but you also want to bring in a lot of people to to really, you know, invest in what will be an exciting, very exciting opportunity for the city. And then, you know, the DNC is going to build their team. Um, everyone is going to run the boiler room um, in the convention to the folks who are going to run the stage. Uh, there's going to be, I mean, parties galore, 10 a night here throughout the city, if not more, the night before the convention, every night of the convention. Uh, and hopefully what we're going to see, too, is like a real engagement with Chicago and with Chicago uh, you know, organizations, nonprofits, the civic, uh, you know, the, the fabric of the city. Um, it's an opportunity to really showcase that to the world. You know, I think I, everyone probably agrees here. We often get lost in the shuffle. It's like it's all about, you know, L.A. or, you know, New York. And, you know, the only time, you know, folks want to pay attention to Chicago's and want to talk about crime, unfortunately, we're so much more than that. So, it's an incredible opportunity to showcase just how wonderful the city is. I mean, warts and all, it's the greatest city in the world. And the convention gives you a chance to showcase that. And it's 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 going to be incredibly exciting, but there's going to be hundreds of people working behind the scenes to make sure that each one of those shots and each one of those speeches that you're gonna see when you know the 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 switch flips to go live every night. Uh, goes off um, and looks okay. professional but, and delivers the messages we need. So, and also we'll showcase Chicago as a beachfront city, a cultural city, whatever you want. When I wrote all, I, I covered the run up uh, to Chicago getting the convention. And one of the lines I liked the most of what I wrote, New York and Atlanta were the rivals with really Atlanta, the main one. I did say, to quote myself, bear with me, that <laughs> Chicago has everything that New York had except the Statue of Liberty and garbage in the streets. But speaking of the streets and crime, uh, who wants, I mean, Alden, you have a perspective as a number cruncher and as, as uh, writing about the crime problems of the city. Uh, what if there are problems in the run-up in the convention? We have a NASCAR race coming. Is, how could this, is this going to be in a way how, uh, the, is the city's image on the line here if any little skirmish happens, if we have a repeat of the melee at, in Millennium, Millennium Park? Oh, you better believe it. Uh, I think uh, this, the city's reputation is on the line literally from, <laughs> from now up until and, and uh, the conclusion of, of the convention. Um, uh, and even what happened uh, early this month is an indication of that. I mean, it became national news uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the skirmishes that that took place uh, on that particular weekend. And there are going to be more of those. I, I don't know if folks remember, but it was a few years ago. There was a similar kind of night uh, that took place downtown with a lot of teens. Uh, and there was just this boatload of a reaction. And I think that weekend was actually more severe than, than the weekend that we just experienced. Um, so without a doubt, there's a microscope on Chicago, uh, particularly around the issue of crime. We are solidly the reputation is the, you know, the most um, uh, the most dangerous big city in America. Right. Uh, and the numbers bear it out if you're looking at the very, the most 10 populous cities in America. Um, we are in the middle of the pack if you drop down to the, the, the top 35 or right. top 50 or so. But uh, but yeah, that's our reputation. So any, any light uh, kind of disturbances like we saw earlier this month, it, it's going to be front page news. And the that country. is pressure on, on Brandon Johnson. I just want to say one of the most thrilling, thrilling moments I had in my, in my time covering politics was the first time I walked into, in, in my first convention, 1992, Democrats, Madison Square Garden, New York. I walked in there and it was, it was a physical thrill just to see how bedecked and bedazzled uh, the, the Madison Square Garden was. And I hope 
you know, Natalie and Alden, when you have this first look, for, it'll probably be in Milwaukee because one way or the other, uh, you'll you'll be there to do some reporting, and it's so close. You know, I, I'll, I'll do everything I can to make sure everybody gets in one way or the other to attend some sessions, uh, because we will be close. It, I just hope you get to see it, and um, you know, it, it's just one of the coolest things ever. Uh, I've experienced this just to be there. Tom, what was your first convention? Um, Charlotte in 2012. And, um, you know, an incredibly memorable experience. Uh, the thing that I also want to flag for everybody, um, you know, 2020's convention being virtual and uh, almost a television uh, special, um, and the president's inauguration also having a very similar quality to it. Um, don't sleep on the fact that uh, Cinespace is probably going to get a bunch of use in this uh, 2024 um, wow. convention because the world is uh, interactive and virtual and just different uh, in a way um, before COVID. So um, Chicago's got some extra um, things to think about as we move forward here in the next two years. Aviva, and Lynn, I know, oh. you know Madison Square was was bedazzling. I don't doubt that, but I, you know, I'm biased. I think Chicago can outshine it. I really do. I'm really excited about this uh, being in Chicago. I think that, you know, I agree with everything Alden said. I think there's going to be a spotlight on any type of skirmish or um, uptick in crime, um, and I think that's all the more reason that you know Mayor Elect Johnson the left, the right, the business community, that everyone has a shared interest in being on Team Chicago because we are about to have this spotlight. Um, but I'm excited about it. You know, like, like you said, we're a, a lakefront town, we're a union town, we're a diverse town. And I think that, um, you know, the convention is gonna bring a lot of business to the community. Um, I hope that it's it's spread out, not just in, in and around the convention itself, but I hope that, you know, that um, folks get to see all of Chicago's neighborhoods and, and leave their money there as well. Right. Um, I think it's going to be a great thing, and I think Chicago's going to rise to the occasion. Right. In 1996 convention here, United Center looked, it, it's it's stunning uh, on this. Mm -hmm. And on this well, note... Well, Daly made sure of it, Lynn. He had to bury that ghost of 1968 for <laughs> right. his dad, yeah. and he put his heart and soul into that. And I remember at Navy Pier, he had a news conference on that Friday after everything went swimmingly, and including the weather. I, I bet he seeded the clouds and made sure that it didn't rain and everything was perfect, literally perfect, with the beautiful medians to Madison Mad, on mm -hmm. Madison Street to the United Center. And when he looked up at the heavens and said, Dad, it was like he was saying, Dad, I, I, I fixed it. I rewrote the script for you. And so uh, Chicago was perfect. And we can only pale by comparison because it was so Perfect. 96, right. And on that thought, we're going to wrap up because I'm sure in the months ahead, we will be doing many at the table convention uh, segments and shows because there is just so much uh, in, involved in it to explain to the city, to kind of share what we see and learn on, on the road to the convention, which this week was marked by Joe Biden's official announcement of a re-election, and Senator Tammy Duckworth is one of the co-chairs, and J.B. Pritzker's former top political advisor, Quentin Folks, is the deputy campaign manager. So we'll have lots to talk about in the future, but for now, I want to thank this great panel for sharing all your insights and analysis on this latest edition of At the Table.